um, the last for this series at least of the Physics Cafe that we have here at St. Mary's. And uh, um, today, we <laughs> so, today will be um, my colleague Ali, who is uh, um, one of my um, lecturers at the Applied Physics degree we have here at St. Mary's. And Ali is a cosmologist and he will be talking about testing gravity in the solar system. So I leave it to you, Ali. So what I'd like to talk about today is gravity, solar system, cosmology, those kind of very big ideas and ways in which we can test it and ways in which things like dark matter and dark energy, all these kind of buzzwords are being so we've heard about. And maybe even thinking about some, some, some new ideas that we've come up with as well and where we go from there. So question number one is what is gravity? Who thoughts? Anybody? Give me an idea of what is gravity. A pull. A pull is good. An attraction, maybe. Massive objects appear to have a sort of gravity. Gravity is a fundamental force of nature. And it appears that when we have massive objects, they attract. This force, this attraction is weaker as the objects get further away. But also the question is, is gravity is one of the forces of nature. Has it for some of any of the others? So some of the other forces include the electromagnetics. Everything that we see around us is caused by the electromagnetic force. It's a sort of light, for electricity, for magnetism, for many types of radiation, X-rays, gamma rays, are all manifestations of electromagnetism. Very different from gravity. There's also the nuclear forces. There's a nuclear strong force. It's responsible for keeping the nuclear stuff together. We've got something like protons. Protons have this positive charge that they want to repel. But something has to keep them stuck together, otherwise all the atoms that we have will all disintegrate. And you might think, well, what about gravity? Gravity does stick things together, but in fact gravity is quite weak. And the thing that we need to keep protons together is the nuclear strong force. The nuclear strong force is much bigger than the electromagnetic. There's also a weak nuclear force, that's responsible for things like radioactive decay. Gravity is in fact the weakest of all of these fundamental forces. And in physics we have a description for the electromagnetic force, we have a description for the nuclear force, and we can in fact write it down pretty much using the same mathematics. We can write them all together as one thing. Gravity is weird in that we have not today to work out a way to write it down. So gravity not only likes to sit out on its own, but it also appears to have this kind of weird properties. So the question, some, some, some deeper questions really are, where does gravity originate from? Why is gravity weird like this? And what behaviour is there on the universe? Think about the universe and everything in it. All of the gravity must be acting on everything in the universe. What is the effect of that gravitational force on everything in it? Everything that has ever existed and will ever exist is going to have at some point or another gravity effect on it. So what's that? What's the effect of that going to be? So we're going to discuss some of those things this afternoon. So all good scientists will learn. If we come up with an idea, let's say we come up with an idea of gravity, we have to test it. We can't just come up with these ideas in isolation and say this is the perfect thing. We have to come up with some way in which to test our thing. Right? So what we can do is we can use the equations, we can select something that we call a physically relevant situation, and in our example I'm going to show you, we're going to pick planetary orbits. So something that we know is there, we model it mathematically, we write down the equations, we solve them, we calculate, and when we have that number, that calculation done, we go away and we measure it, let's see if it matches what we observe, that just that number. So for instance, it could be, what's the length of a, a year on Earth, what's the length of a year on Mars, something like that. So it's a very easy calculation to do. We can go away, we can measure it, we can go away, we can calculate it, and see what two numbers are. If they do, we can be happy. And our theory of gravity is doing what? If they don't, throw it in the bin and try again. So, for instance, if we consider the planet orbits, we can consider the sun and the planet as point masses. Now, you might think that's weird. All this enormous mass as just a point. But we think, treat things as point masses all of the time. It's the idea of centre of mass. And we know that objects on Earth, whether it's are stable or unstable, their centre of mass is within or outside the, the, the place in which they stand. If I lean over too much, the centre of mass eventually goes vertically, um, the centre of mass is vertically further out than where my feet are, not fall over on one So this idea like, of centre of mass is a very intuitive one. We can do that for whole planets, for whole galaxies, for whole clusters of galaxies. We can treat them as just points in space of a certain 
So we model the planets and the sun's point masses at the centre of them. And then we go away and we want to investigate the forces required for stable orbit. So we start here at this point in the year, we go around one year, two years, three years, we've been doing it for billions of years. So the orbit that we have around the sun is stable. And we need an expression to help us get with this. So we're going to use Newton's theory of gravity. So Newton wrote down his theory of gravity. And he has two masses. So if one mass is big and one mass is small, there's going to be an equally sized gravitational force pulling them one to the other. And it depends largely by the distance squared. So as the distance gets bigger, the force gets weaker. Newton came up with this idea one day, sat in the field, thinking about apple scoring. That's what it's called, it goes the 1666. So we observe, for instance, we try and take a particular orbit, for instance, what's the length of the year on Mars, then we go away and observe the motion of Mars on the night sky, and when it's done one complete loop, we can make a measurement of that year, we can go away and we can calculate it and maps, and we can see that they match, and they match very well for Newton's theory. So Newton's theory of gravity seems to be doing a lot of things for us. Mathematically, it seems quite simple. You can get answers out of it, that's important. But also physically, it seems quite useful. It seems to match reality. So Newton's gravity is doing really well. Another thing that you'll find that planets do is, in fact, they don't have circular orbits. They have elliptical orbits. So an ellipse is just a squash circle. Now, instead of having one centre, ellipses have two points. Okay, one of the points is called an aphelion, and one of the points is called a perihelion. And the point that's furthest away is the perihelion The Earth, the Moon, sorry, the Earth, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, etc. Some of them are quite close to being circular, and some of them are much more squished. And the reason for that is when the solar system formed about five billion years ago, their particular um, motions are locked pretty much in that configuration. There's always a state. So once they moved into a circular orbit, the elliptical orbit is stuck. Now, what's interesting is that the orbit of Mercury is particularly special. Mercury is a weird case. So one, Mercury moves around the wrong way. So one of the planets move around, as we consider from the top, let's imagine that they're all moving around clockwise. Mercury moves anti-clockwise. Again, for weird reasons because of the formation of the, uh, formation of the solar system, uh, Mercury moves around the wrong way. The second thing is, is that this perihelion moves. Okay? So the orbit isn't just sitting in an elliptical orbit flat, it's actually moving up and down like this. We call that precession. So it, it traces out a stable orbit, but the stable orbit slightly changes the angle at which it makes the orbit with respect to the rest of the planet. So all of the other planets in the solar system pretty much stick to that plane, that 2D surface. So this precession occurs, and you can model this precession mathematically as well. You can use Newton's laws to, ex to explain what's going on with the Earth's slightly. You can calculate what that precession is. I mean, the way you can measure it, and people were able to do this. And the measurement that we got in 1859 when the telescopes were this. We've got this number here, and the Newtonian prediction, 531, and we've got the observation, 574. Oops. Newton's theory wrong. We've been teaching school kids and nonsense for hundreds of years. Well, not quite. But there is something to be said about this. So this confused a lot of people for a long time. So for a while, people thought, well, there must be another planet hidden in the solar system okay, that was dragging on Mercury. And we hadn't taken it into account in our calculations. We called this a mystery planet planet X. And people were basically suggesting that because in 1859 observational techniques and telescopes weren't that great, and we just hadn't observed the planet yet, we would find it. And there are various papers in the uh, Annals of the Royal Society from that time, very reputable journal, suggesting what are the properties and the movements of this planet X. And we know that planet X isn't there now, we've never seen one. So there might be something else at work. How do we explain why Newton's theory of gravity is not so that kind of sat around as a problem, but people were like, well, the rest of Newton's theory seems to work quite well. So let's just imagine that, you know, we can put that to one side for a moment. And then, this guy turns up. This is Albert Einstein, I'm sure you all know. And in 1905, he gave us his special theory of relativity. In 1915, 100 years ago, he gave us his general theory of relativity. And one of the things that the general theory of relativity does is it tries to explain gravity. And it tries to explain gravity in a completely different way. What's interesting is 
interesting is if we make the calculation of Einstein's theory of gravity, suddenly we get a much better fit to observation of the Newtonian theory. So clearly, Einstein's theory is right, Newton's theory is wrong. Is it as simple as that? No. Why don't we just use Einstein's theory to talk about gravity all the time? Because Newton's theory clearly isn't right. And the short answer is Occam's right. In other words, Newton's theory works very, very well for most cases. Okay? In fact, we can send man to the moon using Newton's laws. When NASA was working out how much rocket fuel it needed for each stage of the Saturn V rocket to send man to the moon, and then each stage of the lunar lander when it was going around the moon and coming back, all it did is it had a computer using Newton's laws to calculate the amount of fuel within it. It didn't need the complicated mathematics of Einstein's theory. We should only really reach for Einstein's theory when we need to. In situations where Newton's theory is not in the map, because Einstein's theory is hard. It's much harder mathematically to get So for instance, light. We imagine that light is just this massless thing that travels through the universe. But things with no mass, according to Newton, don't have any gravitational pull on them. Einstein differs. Einstein says that's not true. And in fact, you can measure how much light gets deflected by stars. So you need Einstein's theory for that, which is really Black holes. The amount of gravity in black holes is so strong that light can't escape from them. Newton's theory has nothing in black holes. And the beginnings of the universe, if, you to, if you're to speak about cosmology, the beginnings of the universe properly, you need to think about the full, complete picture of the quantum effects and with the relativistic Einstein effects. The Newton theory doesn't have and in fact, we can make some assumptions. And this is an expression for Einstein's theory. It's complicated. But if, under a series of certain assumptions, we can basically make it turn into Newton's theory. We know how to do that very, very well. So, so long as we know that we're moving with those assumptions, we're fine. If those assumptions don't apply, in other words, we're not in what we call a weak field, a very weak gravitational field, and things don't vary in time, then we're fine. We can always use Newton's theory. Otherwise, we've got to go to the more complicated Einstein theory. And that's why we didn't have answers to these questions until the beginning of the 20th century, 100 years ago. Even though 150 years ago, we were able to observe these things. Now, Einstein's picture of what gravity was doing differed a lot from Newton's. Newton's one simply said, uh, object A, object B, they pull on each other mutually, and they have distance between them, okay, and there's a force. Now, we use that idea because in all those other forces, like the electromagnetic and the nuclear forces, they all have the same idea. Objects uh, mutually pull on each other with this force. Einstein said that gravity is not like that. Gravity is a result of geometry. And the classic picture is the picture, for instance, of a, a sheet of rubber or a tablecloth. Yeah. It's nice and flat and a little tall, and it's a mass of it, and it bends, and it gets distorted. And everything that wants to travel along here, its path gets bent. Light rays, the motion of um, planets, and moons, of stars. <coughs> so, for instance, if this is the Earth, the moon is just sitting in the valley around this mass because of the geometry. It's not necessarily the moon and the Earth pulling each other. There isn't like an imaginary piece of string between the Earth and the moon. It's just the facet of the geometry that curves. So this gives us an idea of actually how to treat gravity, not necessarily as a force, but as a geometric force. And then what we can see is that if we get light over here, if, if we are on Earth, and we're looking at light from a distance, well, what we can actually find is if there are other objects behind this distant body, and light moves around, we might not get bent. We call it gravitational lens. And our expectation is that light always travels in straight lines. So if you've got two objects like this, a star behind you, what you end up with is you're going to disk around the around the star. All of the light gets bent around it, then travels straight to the earth. And this is another clear indication of Einstein's theory. It's a prediction of Einstein's theory, and we can see these things in the space. Newton's theory doesn't know anything about it. doesn't know anything about how light and gravity interact. So using GR, we can attempt to, for instance, model the behavior of galaxies. This is a spiral galaxy. And we want to basically think about uh, the motion, the speed at which the galaxy moves, the, light, the luminosity of the light, how bright the light is coming into it, uh, and the size of the galaxy. Those things should all be related. More mass means brighter galaxy means speed is faster. More relative can be that. We still have some issues. What we expect to see is as we move away from the centre of the galaxy, 
different bits of the spiral galaxy which you should just slow down. And they don't. This is what we expect, this is what we see. But a flat galaxy rotation. And this is worrying, because again, this is now Einstein's theory, and we can't get a prediction that matches observation out of Einstein's theory. So again, it's in this rule. Something's not quite matching the theory, what do we do? So there are a few other things that can happen. There appears to be a relationship between the mass of things and the rotation of velocity. It's giving you what it's like. The problem is, is that in our current theories, this is the law that we expect. So if we just take geo on its own, Einstein's really great theory that's interacting with all the surfaces and all the galaxies, it doesn't actually match what's going on. So there's something more at play here. Maybe Einstein didn't think about everything. So how do we solve these kinds of problems? Well, one idea is to introduce what we call dark matter. So everything that I saw in this picture okay, is luminous matter. I look at the amount of light that I get out of this, and the amount of light that I get out of it, I can infer from that uh, how much matter there is in the galaxy, visible matter. And then what I can do is I can, from the speed at which things are rotating, I can figure out both size and velocity. What if there's more matter that I can't see? And if there's more matter that I can't see, then the galaxy is moving as fast as they can. It's fine. Okay. More matter means things in the gravitational system are moving fast. If there's less matter, because that's what we appear to see from the light, then it should slow down. So maybe there is a sort of dark matter that can explain everything that's going on. This is really good, actually. If you put dark matter into your models, it explains everything you see in galaxies. It explains everything that we see when we run simulations of the early universe. If there isn't enough matter in the early universe, the the universe expands, and there's nothing to basically come together. We wouldn't have what we call the seeds of large-scale structure. We wouldn't have galaxy, the beginnings of galaxies. We wouldn't be here if there wasn't enough matter in the early universe. The universe would have just flown apart. There had to be some more matter to make sure everything clumped together. The problem is with dark matter is that no one's ever seen it yet. And we keep looking for it. We keep looking for it on top of the International Space Station. We keep looking for it in the Large Hadron Collider in the US. We keep looking for it 50, 60 years down the bottom of mines in Yorkshire. We can't find it. Now, you can argue, well, okay, it's quite hard to see. Yeah, sure it is. And the tech to get better and better and better. But even the people who have been hunting for it for decades are starting to wonder, hmm, is it really there? We fundamentally misunderstood something. Did we, did we think about something in a convenient way and then didn't think about the consequences later? That might be the case. So are there any other ideas? Well, another idea is to basically take the dynamics that we have and modify them. To modify the thing. But we do it at the scales at which galaxies are at. So on, 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 on the scale of the solar system, on the Earth, gravity seems to work very, very well. But on those galaxy scales, general relativity seems to have a problem. So at this scale, 10 to the minus 10 meters per second squared. And maybe we need to think about having a gravity theory that isn't quite that general relativity. Now, the, the gravitational field strength on Earth is 10 meters per second squared. So we're arguing for a number that is almost a billion, billion times, sorry, a million, million times smaller than the acceleration of life. Very, very small acceleration. Now, it turns out this is quite easy. In the last kind of 10 years, we've even worked out nice ways to make this appear in a very coherent way. You can write properly down a theory that you can get numbers out of and then calculate them as they match it. The problem is that you need to fine tuning. You have to put in a lot of numbers by hand. You have to say, I, I go away and I look at galaxies, and I, from those observations I get numbers, I can put those numbers in and they match. But I have no real way of getting the numbers out straight away. And that's the problem. Because you ex our expectation of physics is that we can put in everything we need beforehand and then have everything we need. It's a bit messy to kind of um, work out numbers from the experiment and then use that to fix it. And say, aha, we knew the answer a lot, but we have to So fine tuning is a problem for those things. Now, these ideas of dark matter and also dark energy, so dark matter is, as I was saying, this idea that you have all of this matter that sits around in the, in the universe, but you can't see it, it's not really we also have this idea of dark energy, which is basically this mysterious force that is explaining why the universe is still expanding. 
the after the big bang, the universe was initially expanding. But in fact, the case of expansion is actually speeding up. It's not slowing down like you would expect from something that's speeding up. So the time it expanded and then the gravity was pulling it back and actually it's speeding up. This is something we believe is known as dark energy. Dark energy won the Nobel Prize in 2011. The observations made in the early 90s. This is that means it's true. And we're saying that scientists are pretty convinced that what they saw can at least be explained by something called dark energy, whatever that is. So in 2013, scientists were able to make this measurement. This is a picture of the night sky. Temperature fluctuations in the night. So if you look up in the sky, sensitive enough thermometer, you can detect about three degrees of heat. That three degrees of heat is known as the cosmic microwave bang. It's the leftover heat from the Big Bang. So the temperature of the Big Bang um, a few seconds after was, was about 10 to the power of 10 degrees Celsius. So that's one followed by 10 zeros. And then the universe expanded, it cooled down. The energy density dropped dramatically. Nearly 14 billion years later, that heat is now at 3 degrees. But in fact, it's at 3 degrees and it's slightly hotter in some places and slightly colder in some places. So this is basically telling us where the hot spots and the cold spots above or below that 3 degrees. But the hot spots and the cold spots are a hundred thousandths of a degree big. And they're really tiny fluctuations. So unless you're a really sensitive enough satellite that can measure these things the monitor, then you can't see them. So the earliest satellite that went to measure this in, in 1990 produced one picture. A series of satellites produced a picture in 2003. And these produced the best picture we've got so far in 2013. Now you can't easily go much better than this picture. Okay? We're basically the limits of technology. Because in order for you to measure something cold, you have to be cold. Okay? You can easily detect what's cold. What's cold. So they had to pull their satellite out in space to something colder than this to measure the deviation time. So from that picture, we were able to get what we call the power spectrum. So the power spectrum tells us as we go along in the sky, okay, so if we move in just 0.1 of a degree, 1 degree, 90 degrees across the sky, how does the temperature change? And the red points are the data points that we get from this from the, the, the map of the show. And the green line here, the thick green line is here. And what's interesting is that the theory, the red point, pretty much match. Once you go to small and small scales, they pretty much match what's going on. Some of these have bars on them, they're obvious. So you make a measurement, then you make another measurement, and then you make another measurement, you see what's the range of those measurements. They're all really close together, the error is small. They're all a bit spaced out, the error is big. It looks like as we keep going along here that there are no more error bars. It's not that there are no more error bars, it's just that they're really, really small. They're smaller than the size of the point you make them grow. So what this picture does is it assumes dark matter, it assumes dark energy, it assumes visible matter, it assumes general relativity, and we seem to get a pretty good fit, the best ever fit we've got to a theory of observation. And what, the, what the, you have to put into your theory is that you get a universe that's made up of about 5% of ordinary matter. So 95% of the universe is made up of weird stuff. About 26% dark matter and about 68% dark energy. So most of the universe is made up of an energy we know nothing about. We know zero. We know that it causes the accelerating expansion of the universe. That's it. The dark matter we think maybe we have a better idea of than that we know what it can't be because we've been looking for it. And we know that we can, and all of the places that we haven't found, we know what it can't be. And there are so many possibilities of similar. So we know really a fraction of what the universe is. Doing. And so these are the two cornerstones of modern cosmology. The theory of gravity, this idea that the universe will behave predicted by dark energy and dark matter, and input to matter. And what they let us do is if we if take these assumptions, we can draw together a series of observations, a series of predictions, a series of match observations. And so we can basically keep going back in the past. We can understand how energy and matter was distributed in the universe. That map of the temperature tells us what the universe was doing. The universe was about 330,000 years old. The universe is 14 billion years old. So we can go back nearly 14 billion years to what the universe was doing then. And this temperature now tells us what the matter and the energy was doing then. As I've explained to you, there are some issues. There are some issues with the general relativity. There were some issues with the dark matter. In order for us to match the galaxies, we have to 
for dark matter. Then we don't understand what dark matter is. In order for us to match the cosmology, we have to get dark energy. We have no idea what dark energy is. So, how hard do you have to work to, if you like, reach the next generation to actually say, yes, I'm happy with this? Um, so far, all of my observations match my predictions, and I'm very clear about what's going on. So our demons come up in the 80s. So basically it's a way to explain where that flat rotation curve comes from without the dark matter. And basically what it says is that if you take Newton's second law, Newton's second law is F is That's one way to write it. And the F here is the gravitational law that we've been talking about. And the A is something called the rotation velocity. So if you know the velocity of particles in the new ground, and you know the size of the orbits in which they're moving in, you know the acceleration. Those are the squared over. And the gravitational force does like a constant, a very small number. The size of the two masses divided by the size of the orbits. Now the idea is to reform this law, which is held quite sacrosanct in the gravitational physics, and change it when we get to the sixth position. Now you might think, well, why? If we can use it to explain what's going on with these rotation curves, that was invented a new form of matter that we haven't been able to see. Maybe that's the reason. And then we can explain the other consequences. So what you do is you add an extra term into this Newton second law. And what that extra term does is it gives you exactly the behavior that you imagine. So it gives you the Newtonian behavior when you want it, which is get an acceleration much bigger than the galactic. Constant. So the V goes to constant is a flat rotation. So what I did was add an extra term into my law of physics and I can explain what's going on without assuming any weird maths, without assuming any But then you say, okay, so I, I can, I've worked out how to fix rotation. So I'm going to test this in a little different range to see if I can make this work in other regions as well. But the problem is, is that we need to test it in low acceleration environment. This angle of loss, the total acceleration is 10 to the minus 10. As I said on Earth, the acceleration is 10 meters per second. So we can't test this theory on Earth. Now that sounds like a problem, but it's okay. We're used to not testing everything on Earth. We have to find somewhere that isn't a galaxy that's millions of light years away to test these theories of gravity. Now it turns out that you can find just such point in the solar system. So if you pick two masses into the sun and the Earth, gravitational masses are attractive, right? From, uh, let's say, from the International Space Station, the orbit of the International Space Station decays, okay? Because eventually it fall into the Earth. And what every so often they have to have retro rockets to push it back into the orbit. So, the Earth is attractive, the Sun is attractive. There will be a point in between where the two attractions cancel out. Okay? And in fact, if you write down the theory of gravity for the sun, the theory of gravity for the earth, and you see that one is a minus sign and one is a plus sign, minus and plus at some point have got to equal zero. And so there is a point somewhere between the earth and the sun where the acceleration is zero. Now, if the acceleration is zero there, close to it, it must be small. It must be around this 10 to the minus 10. So we want to go there. And those points are called satellites. That's the mathematical term for those points. And satellite points are really easy to picture. They're prinkles. They're just prinkles, that's all they are. If you ever go in and you see more and you see um, prinkles, there you go. That's a satellite mathematics. What it has, it has a, a minimum in one direction and a maximum in the other direction. So if you're here, the Earth is over here and the Sun is over here, you're going to fall down towards the Earth and fall down towards the Sun. It's a very unstable point one way, but very stable point the other. And so these sound points are very good if we want to test these ideas that we've been speaking about. So it turns out that in this weird theory, force is going to basically go out the square root of the, the distance between them, around the southern point. Now that's interesting if you want to test forces, but another point that we use is the so-called tidal stresses. Tidal stresses are what cause the tides in the Earth. Okay? Uh, when the moon is in a particular position in the sky, it pulls on the tides. It pulls on the tides so that they get stretched as they come in or out. It looks like squashed. And the distribution of that, so the variation of the force of the distance, 
move, what we call tidal stress. A stress is just some force that we put on something. And we're used to free just taking the elastic band and stretching it, putting the stress on the tension. But that doesn't necessarily need to change straightforwardly. It can change in different ways in different directions. Now, the tidal stresses for this force basically go like one over the distance. The thing is, is that what that means is if you get to the sample point, the tidal stress is enormous. One over zero is infinite. So, this isn't what happens with the regular Newton or, gravity or Einstein gravitational force. It's what happens with weird fluid that fixes the rotation of force. And so scientists are interested in using this as a way to measure whether we have these weird things in space. And so this is the setup. Around the Saturn point, there must be some weird region where the weird theory applies. And if the weird theory applies, we can make weird observation. Because the weird observation is very different to Einstein's estimation. And that's good. How do we do it? Well, this is a picture of the later interferometer space event. This is a space mission that was proposed by the European Space Agency. And what it's looking for is ripples in space time. So we're used to having a pond, and there's ducks moving the pond, you get ripples in the water. It turns out that from Einstein's theory, the one key observation that we haven't made yet is that there should be ripples in space time. In that flat, so you take the table off and it was built. Imagine now that you basically set up and then the ripples in the table. We should be able to measure them. They're very, very weak. And one of the planned missions was to put uh, three of these things in space. The Earth would be somewhere in the middle. Three of these things in space. And they measure that these ripples of space have come along. How do they change? These enormous, this would be about a few hundreds of kilometers long lasers. And you can measure the deviation of these lasers. You might be able to stop these ripples in space. But what's interesting is that these are very sensitive gravitational instruments. And so coincidentally, we might be able to use them to test this other way. So this is the mission in question. This is the least part one. This is a test mission in the big mission. You're not going to launch a big mission straight away. We didn't send Apollo 1 to the moon. We sent Apollo 11. Apollo's 1 to 10 had to go into Earth orbit. Then they had to go around the moon. Then they had to go around the moon and come back. And then they had to go around. So you don't just send something straight away, you have to test the instruments. You're not going to spend 100 billion euros, the Steven Space Agency, um, building a machine. You better test the instruments that work. So they built this thing, it's going to cost a few billion euros. And what it's meant to do is just test one of those lasers. So you have two masses that can be that are free floating in space. And so the gravitational force pulls up one or the other. You can use a laser between them. You said a laser being around one, a laser being around the other. If they match, and you get a picture that says they match, that's fine. If one gets moved compared to the other one, the laser, the image that you get in the lens don't match. And you can see that very, very easily. So you can test the gravitational theory using a lot of tests. Very, very nice test. So this is what we expect to get. This is the Einstein prediction, and this is the weird thing. So this is what you get closer and closer to the rest of the They're very different. Okay? They're very, very different. So it's not that you would expect, not just that you would expect something different. It's so different you can't miss it. Now that's really important. Because if you have an instrument that's really sensitive, so it's these dotted lines, and you have a signal that's very strong, you want to hope you, you, hope you can see it. Now the problem is, is, if you're going to measure something with a meter ruler and it's sensitive to 10 centimeters, that's not correct. If it's sensitive to one millimeter, that's better. Now in science, what we often speak about is we use statistics to work out how likely a result is. So how likely is it that it's actually a result? How likely is it that something happened by here? And it's just by random So if I take, if I flip a coin 10 times and I get six heads and four tails, is it reasonable to assume that the, the coin is fair or not? Probably not. Ten isn't many trials. Once they come, they would take a thousand. If after a thousand, you're still getting 60% um, as one side and 40% as the other, then you can start to argue that there's a chance that the coin is not fair. So we get this idea of uh, this normal probability distribution. So a normal probability distribution basically maps all kinds of different things. If you take a population, um, their heights, their weights, um, even their shoe sizes, okay, they're all mapped by probability distribution. Most people sit around the centre. Some people are slightly shorter, some people are slightly taller. Okay. So although there are tall people in society, for instance, everyone who plays some you know, professional basketball, they're not that many. And there are lots, and there are short people, but they're not that many. Most people sit in the Let's have a narrow band, just some average height. 
and we get this idea of a sigma. A sigma is what we call the standard deviation. Within one sigma around the mean, well, the chart is only mean for limits about 30, 52, it's just under 32 percent. If we go to this two sigma, we're covering more of the population, the chance of what's left is five percent. The gold standard in physics is five sigma. When we were looking for the Higgs boson, you may have heard of the Higgs boson a couple of years ago, we were waiting until they'd collected enough measurements to hit that five sigma to say the chance of a fluke is one in 3.5 million. So the chance of this being right is one in 3.499999. Enormously large chance that something is right. In this experiment, one expects to get 28 sigma. Now that's great, because it tells you either that your theory is right and you're going to see something, or if you don't see something, it tells you your theory is wrong beyond belief. So it's a double-edged sword. Either you see something and you can say, okay, Einstein wasn't quite right, I'm off to collect my neighbor words. Or you can say, back to the drawing board, these theories are so wrong, don't even talk about them. Now what's interesting is in fact, 28 sigma is in this band here. People think we can actually get close. So this is saying, what if the, the noise, how sensitive the instrument is, is probably down here. And what if you can get very close to the sound? get very close to that point in space with the gravity factor. So this is 50 sigma, 60 sigma down here. And now they think that's, in, that's likely to be found. Now, this is a nice test, but also it's a nice test because it's direct. You go to a point in space and you measure something. You don't have to do astrophysics. Astrophysics is messy. Astrophysics is messy and as you'll see like this. You can take the, you can go and investigate what are the different acceleration scales of galaxies. So dwarf galaxies are small ones. Gas disks are the galaxies that just sit in this. Spirals basically, and they, they're a bit more even there. So then you can get groups of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And then you go away and you say, what's the acceleration scale? Because remember the number I talked about was that 10 to the minus 10, is the galactic acceleration scale. And lots of galaxies, like these spirals, they're pretty much around that. But lots of these are not, they're actually big. Okay? And some of these are no. So if you're going to do everything with astrophysics, you're going to be in trouble. It's nice to have a nice direct test, which is what this test around this cancellation is. The final thing I want to say is that we can test gravity with, with planetary constraints. So we know that the orbits in the solar system are nice. They're nice and elliptical as general relativity. We know that galaxies are doing something if we include the dark matter or whatever. But actually there's a very big region when we think about accelerations that isn't tested. And that's interesting because this test will test what's in the middle. So, Scientists have been waiting to test everything from the very big to the very small. Um, and it, it looks like there's an opportunity to do that. So, the last thing I want to say is that it appears that we have the main ingredients for our fitness. And we appear to have some idea of what maybe the universe is made of, even though we don't necessarily well understand that. So hopefully you'll see that there's quite a lot about the gravity in the universe we do understand, and we can measure a lot now, although this is precision science, but there's still quite a lot to be figured out. Um, every time I go and speak to school children, I say, that could be you, that could be you, who, who, who changes our understanding of the whole universe. Okay? Because so far, there are lots of big questions that we haven't answered. Um, thank you for listening. Any questions? Very interesting uh, talk. Do you have any questions for Ali? Based on what uh, I want to say about any curiosity you have about cosmology or space physics uh, or anything. Yes, Johnny. Uh, Neither does anybody else, no more, I mean, you yeah. uh, Basically, as far as understanding the it's, it's needed as an assumption for the mass to work. Yeah. Okay. Are, you, are you allowed to do that? It's going to be still in the gap. Or something that's not going to be Sure, so in it, well, so in, in the history of science, you'll find that's quite common. People come up with ideas okay, to fill in the gap, and then they say, okay, if I assume that, one, what else is it involving? Two, where else? How can I find it? So, when they did that with the dark matter for the galaxies, then they said, okay, if there's this dark matter hanging around the galaxies, how much is it? They're more or less invisible at 
appears at this point. What happens if we put it in, into the early universe? Well, it turns out not only can we put it in, we need to put it in. So it, se it, it seems to be needed in lots of different areas. So that's a strong indication that there's something to play. There's a, there's a strong idea that maybe this, this is right. The problem has come for dark matter is that no one's been able to find it. They keep looking and they haven't managed to find it. And either it's very, either it interacts very, very weakly, which is true, gravity is a very, very weak interaction. If I'm standing here, I don't necessarily feel that I'm pulling on the sofa and the sofa is pulling on me. Whereas I can take a fridge magnet and pick up here, and it can defy gravity. So the problem is, is to find the dark matter in any other way other than with gravity is quite hard. Um, but you're right to say, well, we've been looking at, for it for a long time. Didn't we just fit in a physical mass? Yeah, it's a strong argument that that's what it is. And this is where this other idea that I was talking about, the modified mass, has now become a bit more popular. In the 80s, it was kind of considered, well, it's an idea. There are 100 ideas that are coming up. It's an idea that's kind of stayed, and it's almost at the same position as people say, OK, well, maybe the dark The dark energy is more worrying. Because, as I showed you in the pie chart, it appears that most of the universe is dark. And we have, I can't emphasize enough, no clue what it is. And worse than that, if you try and put together the quantum ideas of the universe and the gravity ideas of the universe, they don't match. And one of the things they don't match is the dark energy. The quantum ideas predict an amount of dark energy you can get. It's something of the order of 10 to the power of 100 smaller than it should be. So that's one followed by 100 zeros. Okay? So the number is astronomically wrong. But somehow, there's something that's making the universe itself. And it's, 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 for dark energy, it's even worse than fiddling than that. It's just like, we put it in because that, that's the only thing that appears to work. We have no idea. And there are more satellites that are coming through. So that was the mission that's going to be launched this year. There are three more that are going to be launched by the European Space Agency by the end of 2018. All of them are looking for hints of what this could be. Dark matter. Whether they'll find anything ever. But it's something that's on scientists' minds a lot. Because every other bit of general activity seems to match. To give up on it so, so easily when it's um, is, is what a lot of people are shouting about. Any other questions? Any other questions you have? So how, how do you... Does anybody talk about how the universe itself is? So it's a little okay, so it, it, it boils down to what do you mean by the universe itself? So it's a bit like we live in the universe and the universe is expanding. What's it expanding into? A lot of people say, what's it expanding into? Nothing, the universe is just expanding. What it appears is that if I take, let's say I pick year one, two points in space, in year 10 they've moved apart, in year 20 they've moved apart, because the space itself is moving further apart. The universe could be revolving. More than that, the universe doesn't have to be flat. Okay? It doesn't have to have an edge. Okay? We're limited by the fact that light takes a certain amount of time to reach us. Light travels at a certain speed. It's 300 million meters per second. That's enough time. It's so quick it can go around the Earth. This, this comes to be a seven and a half times in a second. Okay? But it still takes an amount of time. So there's a visible universe, and then there's a whole universe. And we're trying to get hints of what the whole universe is like from the visible world. It could be completely different from that. Unlikely, but it could be completely, it could just be like a bubble. The universe outside could actually be rotating. We might be able to get a hint of that from the edge of the visible universe, but because it's the universe itself, it's the everything and everything. It's easy to see, but it could be rotating. What effect would that have? Uh, not much. Because it's the whole universe. If you were rotating inside the universe, if you're rotating and reference to something that's static. If the whole universe is rotating, then your whole reference is rotating. You don't notice the difference. I mean, I'm on the Earth, and the Earth is rotating right now. I don't really feel it. I can measure it very carefully. I have a pendulum that moves. The pendulum will make a slight procession of bits. The Foucault pendulum, you go to the Science Museum, etc., and you can see it. It makes a slight deviation. But that's because we believe we're stationary and the Earth is moving and it's basically pulling on it slightly different as it rotates. But if the whole universe is doing it, there isn't anything outside. Okay. 
Rotating things and gravitating in general relativity produces weird forces, but not nearly enough to cause this acceleration expansion of the universe, unfortunately. People were, were racking their brains for decades trying to find an explanation for this dark energy using just relativity, and they can't find it. So that's what they had to put in this <laughs> Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Any other random ideas? Yes. You say dark matter and dark energy. Now, what is the difference between the two? Oh, because matter and energy could be the same. I sometimes like matter and energy the same thing. So, dark energy. Um, Seeing dark energy, you can sit around in, in, in like atoms or lumps of matter, like regular, visible matter. It's just that we don't know what the lumps are made. Okay, so there are, are there, there were ideas that neutrinos, okay, this is fundamental of the neutrinos, um, could be the dark matter. So neutrinos are just these particles that, that get produced, created from the sun, and the sun undergoes nuclear fusion. These neutrinos get produced, and they're streaming through us right now. But they don't interact with us. We very, very rarely interact with us. There are billions of neutrinos going through all this way. So for a long time people thought, well, maybe the neutrinos are the dark matter. Okay. All they are are matter that you feel gravitationally, objectively, they have a centre of matter, you feel them, but you can't see them. They don't interact with that electromagnetic force. There's no interaction. So it could just be that there are atoms made of some weird stuff, weird dark stuff, that no light interacts with. The dark energy is really quite different. The dark energy is a bit like taking a balloon, okay, and blowing into the balloon with a constant pressure. Every point on the balloon can sort of suddenly going to start moving away from each other. But there's no centre of that energy. It's just everywhere. So if you were if you were like an analogy, let's say you're in a swimming pool. Okay, and you're stood in the middle of the room and you're the visible stuff. Okay, suddenly, out of the swimming pool could be popping in and out of existence all this dark matter. Okay? These voids that pop in and out. But the dark energy could be, for instance, the current. In the so they're very, very different things. The dark energy is everywhere all the time. And the dark matter is particular, you just can't see it. How can you then try to measure or to detect it if you can't see it? Well, well. So, if the dark matter is made of things in our current theories of physics that don't interact, for instance, the neutrinos was an idea, because they're not heavy enough. And there are other ideas for particles that don't interact with light, that do exist. Then maybe we need to find about them, the particle physics properties. So that's what they've been doing because of the Large Hadron Dark. They've been trying to make weird particles could be heavy enough to be dark matter, but don't interact with light. But it hasn't gone very far. So that's really the problem. There are so many ways to make, to protect theoretically, make things that don't interact with light, but then how do you protect them? As I said, the dark energy is even worse. We have to 
put in further dark energy from all durations, for instance, from supernovae. So supernovae are stars that explode, okay? and they give out an amount of light. There are some supernovae, some stars that explode, they're a certain size and they give out a certain amount of light that's fixed. So if you know the fixed amount of light in, in, in space, and you know how far away the, 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 the light is, and you know how bright it should be when you receive it, because it's a standard brightness, it's like having a hundred foot pole at some point in the universe, then you can work out if it's moving away from you or not. Um, so we can, so far, the only way we understand to measure dark energy is from the observation of other things, not just planets and stars, but all galaxies, whole stars, in massive stars as well. The missions that are looking to, to, to be launched, what they want to do is look at old lights, so light from the, 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 the very early light from the edge of this observable universe, and see what the, the motion of the, um, the galaxies look like then. So if you can work out what they're like before and what they're like now, is the amount of dark energy constant? Or did it go up? Did it go down? Is it something that we have been constant? Then that can rule out certain kinds of dark energy. If it's not, if it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, then that means you need a different kind of thing in the field. But we're doing it. Wait five or ten years, and then maybe it'll be in the front cover when we start to do it. There's a sort of suggestion that the future will actually be able to do it to do it. So the story is, is that um, on the expected lifetime of humans on this planet, okay, before the sun explodes and kills us all, okay, because the sun at some point will run out of fuel, turn into a red giant, and melt us. On that time scale, the effect that you've spoken about isn't significant yet. Okay? These things happen on astronomical times, so billions of years. We believe that we have a few tens of millions of, of habitable life on the Earth if we have the story to it. So, no, is the answer to your question. Things happen on astronomical times because they really are astronomically big. Um, there are ideas to do what we call real-time cosmology, which is try and measure things and then see if we can be better with dark energy, see how much they are changing. But we haven't got sensitive enough instruments yet. Maybe in 10 years' time, we might. If, those instru if these instruments that are on the Earth now in space, there's a, there is a, gen like a generational shift in how sensitive things are. The Hubble Space Telescope, for instance, has been up in space since 1990. It provides massively impressive views of, of the universe. We, we can't get those views from the, from the atmosphere. So once things get more moved into space, maybe we'll be able to say something. But at the minute, we're not, still not quite sensitive enough to see in real time, so to speak, these observations. Any final questions? Any final things? So this is this is the last uh, um, of this series, and the physics cup will be start again um, in October, sometime in October. Still, and we have to decide the new program. But again, we will have one um, physics cup talk every about three months or something. So four physics cup per year, and we will be starting again in October. But we will uh, basically decide. So. Thank you so much for being with us. Hopefully you will enjoy I you will enjoy it. I did personally. So thank you to Ali. So let us thank Ali once more.